Good evening. My name is Robert Hauser, and I'm the Executive Officer of the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to this public program of the Society. I'm glad that you all have joined us this evening. The American Philosophical Society is located, as it has been since its earliest days, in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, the real people. We at the APS recognize their continued presence and honor their community and those of other native peoples, especially through working partnerships and fellowships of our Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Reflecting the spirit of inquiry of our founder, Benjamin Franklin, the American Philosophical Society is a participatory organization governed by its highly distinguished members for its original mission of promoting useful knowledge. The society's mission is supported and advanced by a staff of about 50 individuals committed to the APS idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. We advance our mission with the engagement of leading scholars, scientists, and professionals through election to membership and opportunities for interdisciplinary intellectual fellowship, particularly in our semi-annual meetings. We serve scholars through an internationally recognized research library, collecting, preserving, and sharing manuscripts, artwork, books, and artifacts of enduring historic value. We support wide-ranging research and discovery through grants and fellowships, publications, prizes, and public exhibitions and lectures. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce this evening's program, which will feature a discussion between Nicole Eustace, professor of history at New York University, and Laura Keenan Spiro of the University of Pennsylvania's McNeil Center for Early American Studies. Nicole Eustace is the author of Under Cover of Night, a story of murder and indigenous justice in early America, which is the topic of today's discussion. Among its many other awards, Covered with Night was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for History in 2022 and the Francis Parkman Prize from the Society of American Historians. At New York University, Professor Eustace directs the Atlantic History Workshop. She, her, she received her BA in History with distinction from Yale University and her PhD in History from the University of Pennsylvania. At Penn, she worked closely with the late Richard Dunn, a distinguished member of the APS, who served as its executive officer of the society early in this century. Professor Eustace was also an APS Library Fellow back in 2007. She's also the author of Passion is the Gale, Emotion, Power, and the Coming of the American Revolution, 1812, War and the Passions of Patriotism, and co-editor of the essay collection, Warring for America, Cultural Contests in the Era of 1812. Her articles and essays have appeared in leading historical journals. Laura Keenan Spiro, is the coordinator of scholarly programs at the McNeil Center for Early American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and the associate editor of Early American Studies, an interdisciplinary journal. She received her PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania and has held postdoctoral fellowships from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture and the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research at the American Philosophical Society. Her research and teaching interests focus on Native North America, women and gender, and colonialism in the Americas. Nicole and Laura, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Bob, for that introduction. And thank you to you, Annie, Jessica, and everyone at the APS for making this conversation possible. And of course, for inviting me to be a part of it. 
I, I almost literally jumped at the chance to put Covered with Night at the top of my reading list, and I sincerely enjoyed every page of it. So if there's anyone in our audience who has not yet had a chance to read it, I can sincerely and highly recommend that you do so as soon as possible. Uh, Nikki, I just have to echo what I imagine is everyone's congratulations these days, not only on winning the Pulitzer and other awards with this book, but you know, but simply for the incredible feat of scholarship that it is. I, I think you make these things look easy, but I know that it is the result of many years of hard work. So I, I hope you're enjoying the, the well-earned accolades now. Uh, I, I think our conversation is going to go very quickly uh, over the next hour. So I'm just going to dive right in with my questions. Uh, first off, in the spirit of making sure everybody here is, is on the same page about the book um, and what it's about, could you tell us more about the incident at the heart of Covered with Night, the death of a Seneca man at the hands of two Pennsylvanians in 1722? Um, I'd love to tell you about the book and the central story, but first I do wanna just say thank you so much to everyone at APS uh, for hosting this conversation. And thank you, Dr. Spiro, um, for agreeing to be part of a conversation. Uh, you know, Laura and I both went to Penn, but about a decade or so apart, I think. And we have just been part of this incredible like nexus of scholarly communities in Philadelphia that includes Penn and MCEAS and the APS and the library company and the HSP and, you know, the Museum of the American Revolution and the Constitution Center and we could keep going. I mean, it's incredibly rich and I really, <clears throat> I thought of this book as a little bit of a love letter to colonial Philadelphia and to colonial Philadelphia historians and to the indigenous people of the region, obviously. Um, it's a book that really comes out of so many years of immersion in the scholarship of all of the members of this community. So I kind of think of it as our thing and I'm so happy that I can um, talk to a fellow community member about it. So the story um, at the heart of the book is a murder. Um, there was a Seneca hunter, uh, a very successful one by the name of Sawantani, who was living on the Monocacy River, which is in the broad Susquehanna River Valley, um, in 1722 with his wife, a Shawnee woman named Winnie P. Weta. And he welcomed to his home, to his cabin, two settler colonists who were fur traders brothers named John and Edmund Cartledge. They rode up with a, a train of pack horses on a cold February day and they started bargaining and the bargaining went into the night around a campfire. John was known for illegally running rum and he had brought supplies with him. And this night of drinking and bargaining went bad. A dispute arose and the two Cartlidge brothers assaulted Sawantani quite brutally, um, beat him into, you know, to within an inch of his life. Um, and then got on their horses and galloped away. Sawantani managed to get back to his cabin where he collapsed on a bearskin rug and was tended through the night by his wife, Winnie Piweta. Um, he died just before dawn. And when she discovered that her husband had passed, Winnie Piweta went to go and find help. Obviously, this violent assault that ended in death had the potential to be a bit of a diplomatic problem between the settler colonists of Pennsylvania and the indigenous peoples of the Susquehanna Valley. And in the Susquehanna Valley, it's a very um, multi-ethnic, multilingual community. There are members of many different diasporic groups, um, Iroquoian linguistic and cultural peoples, um, and Algonquin ones as well. And you can see that in the marriage of Sawantani, who as a member of the Seneca, was part of what was then still called the Five Nations of the Haudenosaunee, and his wife, Winnie Piweta, who as a Shawnee was from an Algonquin group. So the settler colonists think that this could create a region-wide conflict with all of these different people. They're really worried, and they think the answer to kind of tamping down the crisis is to promise Native peoples, quote, equal justice, quote, the full measure of English justice. Much to their surprise, that is not at all what um, indigenous people were looking for. 
They had their own entire set of protocols for redressing a crisis of violence, and they began to school colonists in their expectations um, for redressing this wrong um, and for covering the death of Sawantani, uh, whose people would have been covered with night, that is to say, plunged into grief by his loss. Thank you. And I'd like to continue uh, on the topic of justice because as the subtitle indicates, and as you just indicated now, justice is a main theme of the book and particularly colonists and indigenous peoples differing um, notions around justice in a case like this, where one person has died violently at the hands of another. So can you talk to us more about the ways these different peoples conceptualize justice and how this influenced relations between colonists and Native peoples in this period? Yeah, so William Penn had a relatively mild approach to justice in the English context. Um, when he set up the charter for the colony, he had only two crimes that were considered to be considered capital crimes, potentially punishable by death. Uh, but after he passed away, and after William Keith arrived as a new governor, and William Keith was an Anglican who was appointed to the position by Penn's widow, his second wife, who was also Anglican, Keith really um, stiffened the, the Pennsylvania Penal Code and, and created a couple dozen offenses that could be subjected to capital punishment, including not just, man, not just murder, but witchcraft, which they still believed in, uh, and manslaughter. Um, so uh, that really created a great deal of legal jeopardy for these two colonial fur trading brothers, John and Edmund Cartledge, because according to English norms, they should be arrested, they should be uh, jailed while awaiting trial, um, and then if they were found guilty, they should be subjected to capital punishment. Um, and the English represent Anglo-American representatives to the native peoples of the Susquehanna Valley promised them, quote, the full measure of English justice. So they basically said, and they actually did say explicitly, um, that the Cartledge brothers' lives were on the line. Uh, to their surprise, they were met with a complete refusal of that, of that offer. Um, Winnie P. Weta, Sawantani's widow, testified that her husband's dying words were, quote, unquote, my friends have killed me. And that declaration was not just, you know, uh, a statement of kind of personal betrayal of, oh, you know, my friends turned on me. Uh, it was actually something that was deeply symbolically significant in a diplomatic context because it signified that the native community of the Conestoga um, settlement and the Susquehanna Valley more broadly regarded this as an accident that had occurred among friends and not as an attack by an enemy. And the Haudenosaunee had a very clearly defined and well elaborated system for redressing violence when it occurred within a community. Uh, they wanted colonists to um, offer emotional redress. They wanted condolences, sympathies for the grief that the community was plunged in because of Sawantini's loss. They wanted spiritual rituals to be engaged in to restore peace to the community and to cover the death of Sawantini. And they wanted material compensation. They actually used the word reparations um, in the 18th century documents. They wanted material payment in compensation for Sawantini's loss. So there was kind of this tripartite system of emotional, spiritual, material recompense um, that indigenous people expected. And after the colonists had gone through that process of rebuilding community ties, um, they wanted to welcome the Cartledge brothers back to the community at Conestoga where they had been living. Um, they said literally one life is enough to be lost. There should not more die for this. So this set up two pretty diametrically opposed approaches to justice and it set up a great deal of debate because Governor Keith is a newcomer in the colony. He's just pushed through this harsh new penal code. He feels like he has to uphold it. 
doesn't really, really, really want to murder one of his own colonists, which is, you know, maybe um, doesn't want to execute. That's the right word. Sorry, I had COVID, so I'm, I'm working on two weeks ago. So I'm working on, like, not misspeaking. Anyway, he didn't want to execute one of his colonists if he absolutely didn't have to. Um, so he wants a workaround, but he really wants to follow English protocols. And it let it took many, many treaty councils and many negotiations and many efforts on the part of native people to state and restate their position um, before they eventually prevailed and in fact did force uh, Pennsylvania colonists to follow their protocols to the letter. And so speaking of the treaties and the way that this crisis ultimately resolved in some ways at least uh, diplomatically, um, it comes to an end with the Great Treaty of 1722. And one of your introductory points is that the tr Great Treaty of 1722 held between various nations and English colonies in Albany uh, and should be considered a founding document of the United States. Could, so could you tell us more about what is in the treaty and why it is continues to, why it's so important and why you think it continues to be so important? So what, what happened is that the five nations had already called a treaty council at Albany. Regular meetings to kind of refresh, revive, and, and strengthen uh, ties across communities were a feature of native diplomacy. So the five nations of the Haudenosaunee had called this treaty council at Albany uh, for the summer of 1722 uh, before they even heard of Salwantani's death. But when Salwantini died, this quickly became a very important kind of item on the agenda for this treaty conference. Um, and the leaders of the five nations expected that the governor of Pennsylvania should attend this treaty con conference um, to engage in the necessary protocols. He had to pay them the respect of an in-person visit to offer his condolences um, to go through these rituals of repair um, and to pay reparations in person. Um, and they told him that they expected him to come. He didn't want to. He argued back and forth, um, but eventually he had no choice. He went to Albany and what the treaty preserves is in a record of that meeting of the condolences that were formally ritually offered by the Pennsylvania colonists and the way that they were accepted by the leader of the five nation leaders of the five nations, um, and then it, it also documents the statement of the leaders of the five nations that um, the Cartledge brothers should be set at liberty, that they should not remain bound, that they should be free um, to resume their lives and rejoin this multi-ethnic community that they had been living within. And my argument is, this is the oldest continuously recognized treaty in Anglo-American law. It is still in effect to this day. And as such, it's part of our national heritage as much as any other founding document. And this approach to reparative justice, which sounds so modern, actually has these centuries old roots in Haudenosaunee culture. And I think that this is a resource that we could be drawing on as we're looking for solutions uh, for progress today. Ah, sort of on that theme of the continued relevance of the treaty and of this story, um, I don't know if you intentionally set out to, to time the book such that it is the 300th anniversary of these events, but um, it is a, a, a conveniently round striking number. And I, I'd like to hear you speculate. I know counterfactuals are very difficult, but how do you think things might be different in the United States today if colonists like William Keith, like James Logan had um, not only followed the form, but I guess really understood the function and learned the lessons that indigenous leaders were trying to trying to teach them about indigenous forms of restorative justice? Well, I think it would have been transformative throughout, you know, much of our history. The, the really kind of key point from the indigenous perspective is that when a person commits a transgression, 
they don't lose all their human worth. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't lose their potential to contribute product productively to the community going forward. It doesn't mean you pretend it didn't happen. Um, there is this very intricate process of redress that really tries to, you know, touch on the, emo as I've said, the emotional, the spiritual, the material losses that come through grief and come through death. So there's a kind of an approach to caretaking uh, for the victims, that's quite profound. That's not based on vengeance, but really based on healing and on recompense of all forms. But then there is also this desire to reincorporate the wrongdoer into the community to say, okay, you know, once you have kind of gone through this ritual process, um, you can rejoin the community um, and resume a productive life. Um, you know, and so if you think about the lack of support for any kind of, of, of re-entry um, for people who have committed some kind of crime in the United States today, it's quite, quite staggering. Um, there was actually an article in the Times this morning about juvenile offenders who are saddled with, um, they're supposed to pay reparations for what they've done but it goes into some state administered fund that never gets to the victims. And juvenile offenders don't have the means to pay these reparations, which they then have interest on. And so they start adult lives, never mind student debt, with this incredible reparations debt that just is, you know, a weight on them forever. And so you could even think about just, you know, small interventions. Um, you know, at various points in the justice system that would look so different. And I should say, I am a historian. I'm not a policymaker, but I can't help constantly myself seeing these threads, these through lines that seem to touch today. Thank you. And so as, a, as another historian, I guess I'd like to step back a bit and think about how you came to this project. Uh, I think, you know, now that we all are fully agreed on how wonderful and powerful the work is, I am curious about its origins, because as you note in the book, the, um, the, these events are not entirely unknown to historians, though I would say that they're largely covered in or analyzed in, in projects that are ultimately building toward other arguments. It's never the focus of the work. So what made you decide that the events of 1722 were worthy of their own book and that this was a book you wanted to write? It was just a happy confluence of a bunch of different factors. Um, I had an interest in microhistory. I'd been teaching a writing technique course to undergraduates for over a decade. Uh, where we would read micro histories uh, for about half the semester and then I would set them loose on primary sources to write their own. And I really enjoyed doing that. And I initially came to it just thinking, oh, this is an easy way into research and writing for an undergraduate. But I kind of got hooked along the way um, and it became kind of a tutorial. So I was interested in a vague way in micro history, but I actually was thinking about a monograph. Um, on savagery and civility, a little bit of a Bernard Sheehan kind of thing, maybe, but, you know, uh, decades later. And I started reading um, early English books, you know, the beginning of English print in the 1400s, and what did they think about civilization versus savagery, and spoiler alert, they had a lot of really racist ideas that I got tired of reading about. Um, and I was having trouble imagining what the book that would come out of that research was going to look like. You know, it felt like it was just going to be kind of a big data dump of like, well, in 1450, they said this, and then in 1460, they said, and I kind of, I kind of really lost enthusiasm for it. And I also got super just tired of listening to those Europeans. And I thought, where can I go to hear indigenous voices? You know, I want, I want to, to kind of flip the perspective to face East, as our mutual mentor, uh, Dan Richter would put it. Um, and I thought, well, okay, if I want to do some indigenous intellectual history, which was kind of the orientation coming out of the history of the book work that I've been doing, I thought, okay, treaty councils are a place where, um, you know, native thinkers put forth ideas and are recorded in some detail. And I obviously knew Philadelphia archives quite well already because of my prior work uh, on colonial Philadelphia and colonial Pennsylvania. And then I thought, well, 
William Penn, relatively decent record compared to most settler colonists, but after he dies, that's when things start to get complicated in the colony. So I literally opened up the Provincial Council Minutes of Pennsylvania in 1718 and started reading, and I didn't get very far before a man going by the name Captain Civility stepped onto the page, and I sat up straight because here, this is the whole issue that I was interested in. And here was this indigenous man called Captain Civility. I thought, who is this guy? Why is he called that? Has anybody written about him? So then I, you know, start doing, lit, you know, keyword searches, you know, in, in databases of books and articles, who's written about Captain Civility. And I discovered that no one really knew why he was called that. Some people thought it was actually a backhanded compliment, like he was an exceptional diplomat and he surprised colonists by how civilized he was. Other people thought it was an insult or a joke, like ha ha, the quote unquote savage, let's call him Captain Civility. Um, and then I came across, and this is the joy of Google Books, a 19th century historian saying, don't get confused between this Captain Civility and the one in colonial Maryland 75 years earlier. And I was like, wait a minute. There's more than one Captain Civility. This is very, very interesting. So then I went into the Colonial Maryland Council Minutes and found the prior Captain Civility and realized, wait a minute, this is a job title. Uh, and I knew that things like, uh, you know, the native name for William Penn is a pun on his name, it's Feather, but it, but it's a, a pun on his name, but then they called all Pennsylvania governors by that name. So I knew that like repeating a title was an, a native cultural practice. And um, the Maryland records were actually a plea by the Maryland colonists for Susquehannock people specifically to appoint someone to serve as a captain civility as they had previously done. And then I thought, okay, so what this is, is a mid 17th century English translation of a native job title that they don't have the terminology for. They're just trying to kind of feel their way around. How do we translate this concept? Um, and a captain civility, I then I learned about um, the tradition of the Fanny Mingo, amongst the Creek people and Southeastern peoples, someone who is accomplished in warfare, but whose role is a, a peaceful one to draw disparate peoples together. And, it, and I could see that amongst the Susquehannock, people titled as Captain Civility were fulfilling that kind of role of bringing disparate people together in community. And that is, if you go to the OED, it's an obsolete meaning for civility. But that's what it means to bring people together in civil society. So nothing to do with good manners or sophisticated culture. It's about bringing people into civil community. Um, and so when I, when I realized that, I got very intrigued with this native spokesman, Captain Civility, um, who appears over decades. And so you really can trace the development of his thought and the consistency of his thought. And he turned out to be one of the most important um, spokespeople in this case, articulating the indigenous approach to justice as a matter of community repair. And so I had kind of this fascinating central figure to build the story around, and I knew that I had found something about him and his role, who he was and what he was doing, that other historians had not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And actually, I you know, the, the last chapter of your book is titled Captain Civility's Last Word. So you really, you know, he's not only a, an important figure in, in the, the story you're telling, but he is a very, um, well, he bookends the book, <laughs> as you say. So what is his last word? What should our takeaway be from, from Captain Civility in his life? Well, Civility was an extraordinary person. Um, the colonists could never figure out his ethnicity. And that's probably because he claimed multi membership in multiple different native communities. Um, sometimes they thought that he was Cayuga, and sometimes they called him Seneca, and sometimes they called him Susquehannock. They didn't really know. Um, but of course, all of those communities were present um, in Conestoga 
uh, where he lived. He was multilingual in various Algonquin and Iroquoian languages. He didn't speak English, and so that's one important thing about him. His primary role was bringing together native peoples, and as you already know very well, Dr. Spiro, but people who read the book might not, this is a, this is a community that's in a shatter zone that's been in crisis. Um, the reason that, that there is this multi-ethnic community in the Susquehanna Valley generally and in Conestoga particularly is because Native people are drawing together to rebuild community after having been subjected to decades of warfare, disease, invasion, slave raiding. Um, and so Captain Civility's primary role was in his own indigenous communities of bringing people together. And he steps forward to interact with colonists because there's this moment of crisis and he just rises to the occasion. Um, and they were already familiar with him as like one person in the multi-step process of translating um, at, treaty, at treaty council meetings. So civility preserved the tradition of the relationship with William Penn. He accurately represented the contents of the first treaty of William Penn, um, talking about trying to make colonists and indigenous people one body. This is this very powerful indigenous metaphor for unity across different communities. And that's one of the metaphors that we can hear civility using repeatedly over decades. And he also tried to really school colonists in the meaning of civility. He described Salwantini, the murdered man, as quote, a civil man, a warrior of very few words. And for someone with the title Captain Civility to describe his fellow accomplished military leader as civil, he and a man who at least is his attributed last words are that this attack on him was an attack that occurred among friends. He was really describing Sawantani as also part of this project of civility in the sense of trying to make friendships across peoples and bring people into civil society. And Captain Civility critiqued the civility of the colonists. Only after the case was resolved for the first time did he say that the colonists were behaving in a civil manner. And I find that really telling. Um, that indigenous people are looking at these settler colonists and they are not one bit buying into the dichotomy of savagery and civility that governed uh, colonial ways of thinking. So um, that's really his last word is when he praises the colonists for being civil. And of course, I wish that that had been a more enduring development, um, but that's the end of the book. One of the things I really enjoyed and appreciated about the way you constructed the book is how you interspersed more narrative chapters moving the argument along with brief biographies of many of the key players in these events, from Captain Civility to uh, Pennsylvania Governor William Keith. Um, how did you come to decide to do that? And I should say that these biographical chapters also move the argument along, which is a very, um, it's a hard act to do and you balance it all and pull it off brilliantly. But how did you decide that that was going to be part of the structure of the book? And also, you know, it, is there any other one or two of these cast of characters that you would draw our attention to as somebody who, who deserves more attention paid to them in, in colonial Pennsylvania? Yeah, thank you for, for that. Um, so first to the sort of the writing. Um, from the very beginning, I had an outline of 24 chapters with 12 narrative chapters, and I thought I should have break narrative chapters. I liked the idea of being able to do these kind of biographical portraits of particular people. I really, one of the things that I often find dissatisfying in more monographic writing, which I've done a lot of myself, is a person will come in, you learn their name, you have a one paragraph anecdote about them and you never hear them again. Uh, so I really wanted both to show people's involvement in this particular case, but also have the chance to build a more in-depth biography about their fuller lives. As I just described with civility, he's in the record for decades. Uh, and I didn't want to only be able to talk about what he did in 1722. So my original plan was 
narrative chapters and so-called break narrative chapters. I thought the narrative would be in the present tense and the break narrative would be in the past tense. Um, and it would just be like these mini biographies of different important figures. Um, and this was the joy of working with editors at a commercial press um, because my first editor said to me, actually, I want the entire thing in the present tense. Uh, can you do that? And can you keep the narrative momentum going? And I'd only written a few chapters at the point that I got the contract. And honestly, I was like, am I allowed? Right? Because my original conception was like, well, I'll do the monographic work in these biographical chapters, and that'll be like a little more scholarly and traditional, and I'll have fun in the narrative chapters. Um, and the idea that I could do the narrative to go all the way through was really, really fun. Um, and exactly what I wanted to do. So I really felt liberated uh, by that. Um, as far as are there other characters, I really love all of my characters. And I think that each, each biographical chapter kind of does something different in terms of, because I originally conceptualized them as being more monographically linked, most of them really do have a link to like an important theme or argument in the secondary literature. So, you know, um, there's a messenger named Sachi Choa who is identified as Cayuga who goes to meet with the Five Nations. And I describe him and kind of his dilemmas in taking the position in the first place because the colonists try to get him to do it for free. And he's like, uh, actually, you're asking for professional service. I'd like a little payment. Um, so I kind of draw a portrait of him, but then it's a chance to reflect on um, the role of go-betweens, uh, the role of paths and, and information sharing, um, and that kind of work that builds on a lot of other scholarship that's all very footnoted um, in the book. So, so Sachi Choa is another one, um, and I get to talk about Winnie P. Weta um, and uh, Elizabeth uh, Cartledge, who was John Cartledge, the older brother's wife. Um, because they have a kind of an interesting intersection. Um, and it was fun to kind of have a chapter where I could pull out the experiences of women. Elizabeth did not want John to be jailed, um, and she began to weep as he was leaving. And this was a moment to bring out for the reader the fact that the decision of whether to treat a murder as an accident amongst friends or as an act of aggression by an enemy, it was Native women who were charged with making those kinds of diplomatic judgment calls. So it was very significant that Winnie P. Weta was the one to voice the idea that her husband had been murdered by friends. Um, and when Elizabeth Cartledge started weeping, um, James Logan, the secretary, records that the native people at Conestoga, and he doesn't say who they were, went to comfort her. Um, and it's just fascinating to imagine that scene again from the flipped perspective. Logan thinks, oh, she's a weak woman, she's crying, she's such a she's a pain in the neck, she's delaying our departure. But for native people, it was dangerous when a woman wept. It looked like John was being taken prisoner, was being taken captive, uh, which he really was as he was being carted off to jail. Um, and they went to assuage her grief at his being taken captive um, because to them that could have been a signal of more conflict coming. So I have a lot of fun in the individual chapters kind of looking at specific people's lives um, and how they play into the story. I, I think I have time to ask you one more question before we open it up to Q&A from the audience. And I, I'm just really struck by how in your opening remarks, you talked about this book as sort of a love, a love letter to colonial Pennsylvania and to the, um, and to my contemporary community. colleagues. Yes. And to the colleague, I mean, to the colleague, to, to all of us who are interested in it, because I mean, I learned so much, um, from your, your careful research, your deft writing. I, I feel like you obviously invested a lot of time and energy in what might be called world building, although that is a term more usually applied to fiction. But I just, um, just like with the use of the present tense, which created a sense of immediacy and, and put the reader on the ground, the, 
you brought the the sights, the smells, the the sounds of of 1722 Pennsylvania and its environs alive for the reader. So I can only imagine that must have been a ton of work. <laughs> can you talk more about the research that went into excavating all of these these details, the materiality? It's a there's almost a text a text. Well, uh, sorry, um, quality to the prose. So I'd like to learn more about that. And also if you just had any archival finds that were that were fun for you, where you're like, this is definitely going in the book. Um, okay, so I love the term world building and I really did want to kind of pull every fiction technique that I could into writing this narrative without actually writing fiction, without making anything up. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, look, I was so, I was the beneficiary of so many other people's work. Uh, one wonderful book is called The Infortunate. It was a mm -hmm. diary written at a similar time period that was edited by Susan Klepp and Billy Smith, two longtime McNeil Center loyalists uh, who I got to know in early grad school. And I just pulled that out because it comes to mind quickly. But really, truly, this book reflects so many other people's research and work and people that I've gotten to talk to over the years. Uh, and so that it was actually a joy. And for me writing it, it was immersive. I was surprised. It felt almost as if I were reading a novel as I was writing it. I would sit down in my office chair right here and I would just enter a different world. And it was really, really, really fun. Um, so I, I hope, I'm glad that it's fun to read because it was truly just a joy to write. Every minute I felt like, you know, there were, you know, angels singing while I was writing. I just had a great time. Um, and again, I just felt this like connection through time and space to so many McNeil Center and Philadelphia area scholars. Um, finds, the most heart-stopping find was an antler comb. So... One of the sources that I used was the archeological report of um, a dig that they did in the Susquehanna Valley and at Conestoga in the 80s. You would never do this now. They desecrated graves. It's not really defensible, but there's an incredibly detailed, like four or 500 page archeological report of everything that they found and exactly where they found it. And there are many photographs of these items. And one of the items that I really uh, was transfixed by in this book was an antler comb that depicts, there are two panels to the top of the comb. It's, it's a hair comb. And there are two panels at the top. And there are two figures facing each other in profile, a Quaker in a very um, obvious tri-cornered hat, and an indigenous man. And they are each it framed in a separate frame. They each have their own autonomy and their own space, but they're joining hands across the comb. And to me, this was this incredibly vivid material symbol of the native ideal of autonomy and community that they never stopped trying to teach to colonists, that colonists never really got. So I loved that comb and I knew I wanted to put it in the book and I did. I talked about the fact that it could be in someone's hair. And then three or four months later, I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art with my family and we were looking at uh, Dutch portraiture. We were looking, we were there to see a new, a, like a kind of a marquee exhibit on Dutch portraiture. And we did the Dutch paintings and there was a thing off to the side about Native American art. It was a very small installation and it was literally a grab bag. It was like, 1960s American Indian movement posters, you know, some carvings from the Pacific Northwest, from the, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. It was a small room, you know, some Southwestern pottery. And the antler comb was there. And I got to see the antler comb. And it felt, you know, it felt like a portal to the past, to the story that I was telling. It was just such an emotional moment to come upon it completely unexpectedly. This thing that was like, of all of the things in this archaeological report, the most important to me, to find that was really, really cool. Well, thank you for sharing that story with us and for answering all of my questions. 
so wonderfully. Um, I would like to open the floor to Q&A from the audience now. And there is a question and answer feature in this Zoom that, that you can um, type your questions into. We do already have a question from James Brooks, uh, who says, hello, Nicole. Thank you for crafting such an enduring story. I wondered as I read the book about what appeared to me an incongruity for the period and place. In that multi-ethnic refugee region in which your story unfolds uh, is the product of relentless and unmoderated violence in the 17th century expansion of the Iroquois League. Do you think the concept of civility predated the wider violence or may perhaps have been a lesson learned from that era of war? Um, I, the short answer is that I don't know. The earliest reference that I found was approximately 1660, and that does not predate um, Haudenosaunee expansion. But in that period, the Susquehannock were quite consequential still. So, um, I tend to think, this is speculative, but again, knowing that there were analogous diplomatic roles for um, Creek peoples, um, like the Fannie Mingo, and I also have a footnote in the book to uh, a, another scholar's work on some um, New England groups I want to say the Wampanoag, but I could be wrong, but you could look at my footnote. It's been a while. Um, but another scholar who found analogous diplomatic work being done in New England groups, I actually think that just as captive taking was a common feature of warfare for many Native peoples, um, I think that having these diplomatic roles was probably also a common feature of many different indigenous groups. And of course there would be, you know, refinements and particular variations in the specifics of how these traditions would have worked from one group to the next. But um, I don't think it's probably just a reaction to the Haudenosaunee. Although of course we should note that in creating um, the, the Longhouse, in creating the Iroquois League, um, the Haudenosaunee were quite advanced in using diplomacy uh, to contain violence amongst Iroquoian groups. Our next question is from Leslie Taylor. Um, oh, I guess it's not a question. It's more a, a comment that the, the indigenous behavior described is consistent with Graeber and Wengro's view that the indigenous amazement that Europeans would, oh, She's talking about indigenous amazement that Europeans would lock up and punish their own people. And that is a key element of your argument as well, that the loss of liberty, that the loss of personal freedom to, to move yes. freely um, was, was a horrible thing to indigenous people. And they felt that the, the locking up of the Cartledge brothers was something they also wanted to be avoided. Can you, can you talk more about that? Of, um, why this was such a problem for Native people? Absolutely. Liberty and freedom of, of movement was foundational to Native cultures across many different groups. Uh, and if you think about what we know about Native societies, that they were flexible, that they were mobile, that affiliations could be seasonal, um, and that they could also be um, a strategic you know, with groups coming together in larger formations for security as needed, and then dispersing for planting. Um, you need freedom of movement in order to have this flexible network kind of society. Uh, what someone like Michael Whitkin writing on the Great Lakes calls a meal fi, a thousand layer network. Um, so that freedom of movement was just foundational to native, um, you know, food production practices, hunting practices, warfare, security, that was the native way of life. It was predicated on mobility um, and on community, right? You needed these networks of affiliation and you needed these rituals of connection 
um, in order to sustain societies that were not fixed in place, um, that were, you know, that were not place bound, but that were relationship defined. Um, so yeah, you can't really be in relationship if you're in a cage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should just say briefly, um, one of the secondary source books that I came across when I was researching was Kelly Little Hernandez's City of Inmates about early Los Angeles. And what she found was that the first prisons, the first cages introduced on the West Coast in what's now California were brought by Franciscan friars. And that indigenous people hauled before the Inquisition commented on this. Why are you building these cages? So that this idea of, of, of incarceration is a very European thing that goes across European cultures and seems to have been quite shocking to a wide variety of North American peoples. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm reminded of uh, Ian Steele's article on, um, I forget the title, but it was basically why the Shawnees went to war at the beginning of the Seven Years' War. And it was largely because of leaders, Shawnee leaders who had been imprisoned uh, in South Carolina, I want to say. And the colonists, of course, could not understand that this was, they didn't believe that that was really why the people would go to war. But for the Shawnees, this was more than an insult. It was an absolutely atrocious thing for an ally to do. Yeah, no, it was a, it was just an utter viol, a human rights violation, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I should say, you asked what was in that Albany Treaty. But one of the things that was in the treaty was a signal system that the Haudenosaunee were trying to put in place um, to allow freedom of movement across the northeastern woodlands to say that that word should be spread that when people had a campfire because they spent the night in, in one location they should place a rock in the center of the fire to signal that this was an ally that had passed through and they the Pennsylvania colonists were supposed to bring that message to the multilingual, multicultural group in the Susquehanna Valley, and they did no such thing. They, they never repeated that, but it's there. <laughs> uh, so that, that that value of the freedom of movement is articulated in a number of different ways in the treaty. Um, and by the way, that's something I learned new in this book that that was both part of the treaty and that Pennsylvanians did not share it, which led me down another con uh, counterfactual path of what <laughs> what what might have been different if they had. Uh, we have a question from Samuel Talcott. He says, thanks for talking with us. I'm looking forward to reading the book. I'm wondering how, as a historian, you determined the quote unquote contours of captain's civility. If this is a job title, how were you able to determine that you were looking at one individual over decades? Oh, thank you for that, because I left out a really important and interesting piece of this. So Captain Civility was his English language title. He also had a native name or title that was written down about 12 different ways uh, at different times, sometimes different ways on the same page of the Provincial Council Minutes. And I do make the point that no spelling was regular. James Logan, who was probably the most educated person in the colony, spelled Pennsylvania different ways on different days. So it's not a particular reflection of a lack of respect for Native people that they could not figure out how to write down his name. But they wrote it down in lots of ways, and I settled on Takwatar and Sale, because many of the Taki Talense is another one that I remember off the top of my head. A lot of the names that they recorded had that Takwa sound at the beginning of the name. And so um, I could tell that it was him. And I then started wondering, can I figure out anything about what his name means? And there was a Susquehannock to Swedish dictionary that was made by an early Swedish fur trader. That's just a list of a couple hundred words that was then later translated into English. And the word Atakwa is listed and it meant shoes. And if you look at modern Iroquoian languages, the Seneca language, for example, that sound remains the word for shoes. And there are variants because Comparing Seneca to Cayuga is like looking at you know French versus Spanish. They're they're in the same language families, but they're not the same. Um, 
but so sometimes it's a tagua, sometimes it's a taqua, but that, that basic sound formation means shoes. And so I thought to myself, huh, I think this guy, that his name has the word shoe in it. And it probably has something to do with the way he walks between people and his diplomatic mm -hmm. role. Um, and in fact, I recently, since publication, I was told, yeah, um, actually that is a job title. Um, again, among some Southeastern Indians, um, white moccasin or red moccasin, depending if you were on a peace mission or a war mission for, for a diplomat. So um, I think that my, my kind of tentative argument about the meaning of his name was probably, was probably right on. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions from the audience at the moment, but I'll, I'll I have lots of questions, so I'll take uh, I'll take the opportunity to to pose another uh, in the final few minutes here. And one, just you had a line that really stuck with me, and I want to paraphrase it. Um, you wrote of Pennsylvania Governor uh, Sir William Keith, who is a baronet, aristocracy, uh, that perhaps you know he's doing all these things. Maybe, maybe not quite wrong, but he's just not getting a lot right. He's sort of misunderstanding a lot. Um, things are kind of still seeming to work out for him uh, for at least a while. And at one point you write that perhaps his greatest strength was his absolute belief in his ability to rule, that his belief in his ability that he was right and that he had the right to do to do what he wanted. Is that sort of a personal, idiosyncrasy of William Keith, would you say, or is that true of colonists more generally? Is that, and is that, like, how important would you say that sort of worldview was in settler, um, settler colonialism in the British colonies? I love the question, and yeah, both and. Like, <laughs> he is like the apotheosis of this entitled attitude, and he literally was entitled. He was a baronet. Mm -hmm. And I really think that this, this idea that you just, you know, you deserve this because of your birth, because of your position, um, that is something that we know from so many other people's work absolutely filters down so that, you know, every colonist is a little patriarch of his own household um, and is, is, you know, the, the emperor of his own domain, if I could use that cliche. So I... Uh, Sir William, uh, Richard Dunn, my treasured advisor who <laughs> taught me many substantive things about Pennsylvania politics and Quaker religion and William Penn uh, and the Pennsylvania Charter also had the tidbit, the tip, it's never Sir William Keith. Because if you have a title, it's just your first name. So it's Sir William. So I had to correct every time I wrote Sir William Keith. So I can say Governor Keith or Sir William, but you're on a first name basis when you have a title. But right? I mean, does that not capture? So this guy is the apotheosis of an attitude that, yes, I think ca characterized settler colonists more broadly. And we, we do have two late breaking questions. Um, one, I, you know, you did some amazing linguistic work uh, in this book, which you just, you just shared some of it um, in a previous question. Uh, so an, uh, another attendee is wondering, um, you, if you had to work with or contend with Native American languages in other other ways while researching and thinking through your book? Um, you will find attention to language just kind of woven lightly through the book, just one of the many kind of techniques that I drew on. I did analyze that vocabulary list and I was quite struck by how, it was. it's a very brief list, by how many words were for friendship and comedy um, and really the way that that captures the role of trade in trying to build alliances for Native people. That's not my insight at all. There are many um, scholars of Native American and Indigenous studies who have made that point, so I'm drawing on it. But I really saw this kind of primary source um, confirmation of that, of that argument in looking at that vocabulary list. And then some things were very subtle. Um, there was a point when the colonists brought gifts to a treaty council meeting in the Susquehanna River Valley, and the native people were translated as saying, 
we're going to share these gifts around. We're going to break them into the smallest part and give them to the most possible people like a letter. And on a literal basis, that sounds like nonsense, right? It makes it sound like these indigenous people are nuts. Like what they're tearing the stuff up into little bits. You're picturing like a letter torn into confetti. Uh, how we're going to share it around like a letter. But then you think, letter, huh? What about correspondence? What if the native speaker said something that could have been translated as correspondence? Well, correspondence has all of these medical, uh, metaphorical meanings in terms of creating parallels, correspondences between people. So if we think about them saying, we're going to distribute this largesse as widely as possible in order to create these parallel connections, these correspondences, these feelings of likeness between people, now it makes sense to say it's being shared as correspondence and not as a letter. So, um, you know, that kind of work is just woven through the book as I really try to, again, uh, get out of the colonial mindset and try to think about some of the limitations of translation and how I could make logical sense of native statements based on what many other scholars have established about indigenous diplomacy and indigenous intellectual history. Thank you. Uh, we are past time now. It's hard for me seeing questions not to <laughs> not to continue to, to pose them and hear more about your work here and just the amazing scholarship you've done. Um, but I think we, we were actually supposed to stop at seven, sadly enough. Um, I, I'm not sure if anyone from the APS was going to come in again at this point or if... Uh, you, you can wrap it up if that's all right. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jessica. Uh, well, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Eustace, for, for this work, for coming here tonight to, to speak to us about it. Um, everyone in the audience for your questions and for your attention. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to being able to return to this book again and again. Uh, and I, I hope everyone has a chance to read it. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a huge pleasure. It's so fun to talk to you. And uh, thank you again to the APS and to all of the audience members. I really enjoyed sharing the story. Thanks. <laughs>